Like any journey, you cross many different roads, and you look at some of those roads, and some of them look like good roads, ones that you would want to travel because they look like they're well-paved, they're straight, they've got good conditions, and it would be easy to travel. And yet there are other roads that don't look so hot, other roads that don't look as good to travel. And common sense says you want to just steer clear of those type of roads. The Christian life is like that. We have many paths that sometimes cross our own path or that we come upon. And we look at paths and we see them for what they seem to be and what they appear to be. Paths that are easy and paths that are not so easy and rather harsh and difficult. And common sense says concerning those roads that don't seem to be very good or smooth sailing, steer clear of those. And when we relate that to life, we understand no, none of us want to go through hard times. The church has given us a map of sorts. Map, a map that seeks to guide us along the way and to teach us what it means to follow Christ. On this map, we see the road signs such as Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Pentecost. These are all given to give us direction as Christ followers and how we are to be guided in, in, in following Christ. They are to remind us of what it means to, to follow Christ and how faithfully we can follow Him. This past Wednesday, some of you were able to make it out amidst the storm or amidst the snow and the, 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 the questionable weather. This past Wednesday, we had the privilege of being able to have a uh, combined service with the Talmadge Nazarene Church and, and uh, for an Ash Wednesday service. And it was a powerful service, great service. If you've never been a part of an Ash Wednesday service, I certainly would recommend you to be a part of that next year, Lord willing. But it's, 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 a, it's a, a service that, uh, that reminds us that we are but clay, it's a service that reminds us that, we, that God took us from the dust and he created us and it is to the dust that we will return. And, and part of the theme of the Ash Wednesday service is to remind us of, that we will someday return to the dust and that life is frail and life is fragile and, and it is short and it is brief and that we are to be uh, directed upon the importance of reflecting upon our lives. And the things that we truly are depending on in our lives. It is, it, is, it is to help renew our need for daily repentance. It is to remind us about complete dependence upon God. And, and Ash Wednesday officially begins the season of Lent. In which this is the first Sunday in Lent today. Lent is a period of time in the, in the life of the church where... Where that is often signified by the spiritual practices of self-denial and prayer and fasting, uh, often uh, modeled after Jesus' own experience in the desert wilderness, where he prayed and fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. The pathway to Lent, the pathway of Lent is a road that reminds us that the faith journey is not in the easy road. It is not an easy road. In fact, it is often a road where we face, where we are faced with periods of testings and trials. And so as we think about the journey, as we think about the journey that we're on, and we come across these, and we often come across these different pathways, and we have to make a choice between a pathway that looks good and easy, and a pathway that looks harsh and difficult. Don't always assume that the easy path is the because it could be that the hard path, the road of difficulty, is 
God's will for your life. Jaron Rowell says, Lent calls us away from easy religion. It presses upon our hearts the radical claims of the gospel. It confronts us with obedience, suffering, and death of Jesus Christ. And it forces us to hear again his disturbing words. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In the series of passages that Dick read earlier, we were given a storyline that is the basis of our next series of messages that we're going to be encountering and covering during this Lenten season. The journey of the Savior. And uh, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer and a, a promo for the book of Violent Grace by Michael Card. Um, it's a great book, and I would recommend you get that and read that. It's, it's uh, very insightful on, on the cross and what Jesus went through. Much of uh, a lot of the different points and the, the themes that we're going to be covering in this series is, is actually represented in that book by Michael Card. But we were given a storyline as Dick read the gospel passages. And you notice that it, be, it had a beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that's where the journey began for our Savior. As we're talking about and thinking about the journey of the Savior, where did this journey begin? He is God, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And He was in the beginning, and He's always been in existence. But that journey took him down a road where he actually became a man, the Word of God incarnate, and he was born, and it was prophesied to Mary that she was going to conceive a child, and he, she was, he was going to be the Son of the Most High. And then the Word became flesh. And Jesus, the Son of God, was born into the world and we celebrate that great event at Christmas time. But then that journey continued on and it led Jesus down a path that did not seem very good, it did not seem very pleasant. It seemed really good, God coming to visit us. That's always a good thing, right? God coming in the flesh, a cute little baby boy, Jesus. Everybody loves babies. Babies always bring smiles to people's faces, right? But the journey began to take a different shape, and we're going to talk about that today. And if you're taking notes, this is the, today's theme, that Jesus was born to die so we could be born to new life. We celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas, but the reality is He was born for the sole purpose of dying. We all like to think about our life's purpose. You know, we're born. Why am I here for? How many of us think, I, I was born so that I could die? None of us probably have ever thought that we were born in this world for the sole purpose of dying. And yet, as we're going to look at in today's lesson, this was exactly why Jesus came into this world. He was born to die so that we could be born to new life. What do we think about the cross? What do we think about the cross? What value do we connect with it? The cross of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that the image of the crucifixion was not always the sign of the Christian faith. You know, when, today when we see a cross, we automatically think, like on a church building, well, that's a Christian church. You know, it's, it's a religious building and we see a cross, well, that's a Christian church. So the cross is associated with Christ, the Christian faith. But the cross was not always a sign of the Christian faith. In fact, it did not even become signify a symbol in the Christian church 
until right around 420 A.D. That's almost 400 years after Christ. That the cross did not hold any significant uh, perspective or any significance to people's mind in thinking about reminding them that of that to identify themselves as a Christian. Well, why is that? Well, we got to remember at that time, in that time period, the cross was literally viewed more as a modern day horror than that of a symbol. It was. It was still too close to home because they were still practicing the act in the 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 uh, the, the the act of crucifixion. That was a that was a common form of punishment in the Roman and Greek world, and so it'd be like today. You know, say Jesus lived today and he he died a cruel and horrible death on the electric chair. You know, it's like he dies and he goes to heaven and the church begins. Well, let's. Let's use the electric chair as our symbol to identify ourselves as Christians. No, it's still too close to home because it's still something that's going on today. And it, you know, by the time, by the, time for the year 420 A.D. rolled around, crucifixion was becoming a, a very minimal or obsolete way or method of, of executing prisoners. And so it began to take on a different significance more, and it began to become more of a sign and a symbol because of, of what Christ did and what he, how he died. It took on a new meaning and a new significance than what it originally did in the beginning. But fast forward 2,000 years later, it seems as though maybe today that the cross has, has another significance and maybe it's not the same significance that we have often traditionally thought of to remind us, to point us to Christ. In fact, I believe today the cross has lost its significance in people's hearts and in people's thinking and mind. Now, why would it be viewed as less significant today? I believe it is because of glamorizationism. Glamorizationism. That... That it's more, the cross is more of a thing of beauty that adorns the ears and, and the necks of people than it is viewed as an object or a tool that was used to bring about much suffering, in particular the death of one who willingly allowed his life to be crushed for the sake of sinners. I believe that significance about the cross is lost for the most part in many people's minds and hearts today. Even in the church. We, we walk into our churches and we have nice uh, custom made crosses glazed with you know, shiny varnish and lights behind them. And, or some churches that, that, that adorn the crosses with, with great craftsmanship. And it's beautiful thing, a beautiful art of a work of craftsmanship. Even those crosses don't represent what the cross actually was. And you can write this in your next point there. Until we call the cross for what it is and what it represents, then we'll never know what it means to faithfully live for God. Until we call the cross for what it is, it was a tool of destruction it was a tool of death that took the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he willingly laid down his life. It was not, he, he was very clear, it was not taken from him. He willingly laid his life down. And so it represents the call, as we read earlier in, in, in the quote, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so in the mind of Christ, it was the cross that he was about to face. That represents to all of us that thing which we are called to bear. That will require absolute devotion. That will require an emptying of ourselves and getting ourselves out of the way and a willingness to live for God sometimes mean a cross 
That will sometimes, that looks like a life that is unpleasant, that is uncomfortable, that is not popular. That may be the very cross that many of us are called to bear. It is not, the cross will never be found on the road of ease and comforts. The cross will always be felt and discovered on those difficult pathways of life that we must choose to travel down at times. But when we fancy the cross up and we make it an, a, a thing of adornment, a thing that, that is, is pleasant to look at, I wonder sometimes if it doesn't creep into our heart and our mindset and our attitude and it eventually plays out in our life and we, we take the cross for granted and we take what God through Christ did on the cross for granted. Lent is one of those seasons that helps us to refocus, to get back to what it means to be people of the cross. The Apostle Paul said it like this, For I, I, I resolved to know nothing while I was among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, it may, the cross may not have held at that great of a significance as a symbol to be identified with Christian people during that time, but nonetheless, it was the apostles and, and many people of the, of the New Testament writers who certainly did think something of the cross. And, and it was highly significant, so much so that Paul says, you know, I, I have resolved to know nothing among you as he's preaching to the churches, as he's traveling to the churches that he's starting and that he is discipling and he is ministering to. I choose to know nothing among you while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified because that is where it's, that's what it's all about. It is all about what Christ did on the cross for you and for me. That Jesus, his life was taken by this world, yet it was laid down, but his life was suffered and eventually died upon the cross. And what he did on that cross was to bring salvation to us. And so I choose to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was one of the most focused individuals that ever lived. 21 Egyptian Christians must not have had a shallow view of the cross when they faced the reality of just how far their devotion would take them when they had been recently killed by terrorists. Our brothers and sisters in the faith are dying today because of their belief and the, high, and the high significance that they hold of the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross was everything and is everything. I wonder if the majority of professed Christians in the world today are Christmas Christians or Easter Christians. Now, I don't, I'm not talking about those who only come to church on Christmas and Easter but I'm talking more of a view or a perspective. What image do we hold in our mind of God or Christ? Is it the Christmas Jesus or is it the Jesus of Easter? The Christmas Jesus, as I've already alluded to, is that beautiful little baby boy, pleasant, cute and cuddly. He's innocent. And, he, and even a baby has a, has a way of bringing about peace in people's lives. Or do we have the view of the Easter Jesus that prior to Easter suffered an immense, an immeasurable, had immeasurable suffering and experienced a horrible death and his body literally mangled before he experienced death on the cross? How often... Do we think about Christ and what he did for us? Oh, we love, the, again, we love the fact that God came to us as a, help, as, as a little baby. And we can live with that little baby Jesus. What is it, but what does it do to us when we look upon the Savior whenever he is hanging from the cross, bleeding and dying for you and for me? Jesus was born to die. 
And I, I don't think we can fully grasp Jesus of the manger without grasping the, without the Jesus of the cross. And we begin, as we journey with Jesus, the Savior, we see Him coming into our world through Christmas, and we see Him growing up, or before we even get there, we, we have that pr- prophetic word that was given to Joseph and Mary by Simeon. And here we begin to see the first clues of what, what was to be the future of this sweet little baby boy. This child is destined to cause the, ri- the, the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. That's not what you want to hear at a baby dedication. And that's exactly what Mary was given. And as Jesus grew, it was already beginning to unfold before people's thoughts and their minds of what lay lay ahead for this little child. And as Jesus grew, and he answered the call to ministry whenever he was baptized, and he, he went into the desert and was tempted for 40 days and for 40 nights, and he was living with his disciples and he was teaching them, Jesus, we find that Jesus had had, had expressed often to his disciples the point for why he had come. When he says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. In Luke's Gospel, it talks about the Gospel writer talking about Jesus' attitude and, and his resolve. It says, as, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, there where he would face the cross. Michael Card writes, he says, as, as he, that is Jesus, as he made his way toward Golgotha, with every step he knew, detail for detail, agony by agony, how it would end and what it would cost. Think about that. Jesus knew. From the time that Jesus was, well, from all eternity, but you know, as Jesus was human and he did, he did grow in wisdom and in stature, it says, and so it was a discovery. Jesus did have a self-discovery as he got older, but we see little glimpses of Jesus knowing who he was whenever he was in the temple at age 12. But from that point on, you know, so it becomes clear that he, he understands and he is coming to understand more and more his purpose. And it was even prophesied about what, what, was, going, what was looming in his future. Jesus knew what was coming. How difficult would it be to spend yourself to spend your energies, your time in building relationships with people knowing, knowing that that which was coming was rejection, betrayal, and and indescribable suffering at the hands of those for whom you're trying to reach. Could you and I do that? I mean, when we think about the things that we have gone through in life, the tragedies that we have endured through, the, the sufferings that we have encountered. If we knew that we were going to go through what we did ahead of time, do you think we would just carry on and let that come to pass? Or do you think we would do everything we could to try to change that? We would be more fearful. It's about, you know, it's about like whenever I would be sent to the principal's office. Whenever I was a kid. Back in the day when they still had a paddle. Well, I didn't care about him. You know, that paddle was nothing. It was waiting throughout the rest of the day for what was at home for me. Whenever I faced my dad. And just knowing what was ahead, it caused me to squirm even more in my seat. And Jesus knew. He knew as he was taking this journey, he knew what was ahead. Because he understood his purpose and he had surrendered to that purpose. As a Jew, he would have learned the Torah inside and out. Let alone him himself being the very word of God incarnate who inspired the prophets themselves. He knew the word of God. 
is what Jesus would have known about himself from the Old Testament scriptures. Just from the scriptures alone, and, and I have all the references there in your notes. I don't have it all out. You can look at them up later. Look them up later. Uh, but Isaiah 53, verse 3, talks about how he was rejected by his own people. Psalm 41, 9 talks about how he will be betrayed by a friend. Zechariah 11, verse 12, says that he will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Psalm 35, 11 says he will be a, a, accused by false witnesses. Isaiah 53, 7 says that he will be silent when accused. Psalm 22, 7, he will be scorned and mocked. Isaiah 56, uh, 50, verse 6, he will be spat upon. He will be crucified with criminals, according to Isaiah 53, 12. Soldiers will gamble for his clothes. He will be given vinegar mixed with gall and, and to drink in Psalm 69, verse 21. He will pray for his enemies in Psalm 109, 4. None of his bones will be broken, as prophesied in Psalm 34. He will be buried with a rich, in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, 9. All these things were prophesied. All these things were spoken of in the Old Testament which, in which Jesus knew, in which he himself, the very word of God, had inspired to say, Jesus knew. And concerning the sufferings of Christ, there, there perhaps is no other passage quoted more often in the New Testament than from the life of King David, who prophetically gives the details of the events of Jesus' suffering on the cross in Psalm 22. Listen to the psalm and and as what you know of the crucifixion and what Jesus went through, catch the similarities. David cries out in verse 1 of Psalm 21, uh, 22, rather, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? This, this verse alone was, was the exact quote that Jesus cried from the cross. Card says that some scholars believe that Jesus quoted the entire psalm while on the cross, and that the gospel writer just merely recorded the, the first line, because it was in, Je in Jesus' day, uh, if someone quoted the first line, everyone assumed that the, the entire psalm was meant. Verse 7, everyone, David says, everyone who sees me mocks me, they sneer and shake their heads, saying, is this the one who relies on the Lord, then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Do you remember some certain Pharisees and teachers of the law saying that at the foot of the cross? They looked up and says, you know, the Lord, this, is this the one that said that the Lord loves? Let the Lord save him. An exact quote, it, almost word for word from Psalm 22. My life is poured out in verse 14. My life is poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left, my, left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 22 Near, nearly a thousand years before Jesus ex came into this world. Crucifixion wasn't even, wasn't even a, a method of, of uh, execution at that time. I, cannot, I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. What did the soldiers do while Jesus hung on the cross? They gambled for his clothes. Some ask, what, was David quoting Jesus or was Jesus quoting David? I personally believe that those like David, the prophet Isaiah and others in the Old Testament, in order to be able to effectively communicate the hope that God had in store for his people, were given a supernatural gift or ability to enter into what would become the actual experience of Jesus the Messiah. These people like David and Isaiah were given that special supernatural gift to be able to enter into the experience of what was to be Jesus' experience some thousand years later. But either way you want to look at it, what stands with certainty is how intimately Jesus identifies himself with the human condition, with our condition. As the Hebrew writer says, he too shared in, in their humanity. He shared in their humanity so that by his death, in which he was 
he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus died so that we could be born with, uh, uh, with new life so we do not have to fear the unknown of death. Because he's, he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This Lenten season, God wants to remind us that God longs, last point in your notes, God longs to grant us spiritual insight to enter into Jesus' experience. Jesus is our supreme example. He is our model. To enter into His experience has one ending. That is resurrection. But we need to understand this morning that the path of Jesus, the journey of the Savior, is a path that, that, is, that is a journey that is full of pathways that are harsh, that are difficult, that, in, that encounter suffering and trial and turmoil. There are good paths, there are smooth paths that in which we will travel. Not all those smooth paths are necessarily deceptive or bad. But when we look at the life of Christ and the journey which the Savior took, There was, always, there was a crucifixion, and there was much suffering before there was ever resurrection. He longs for us to, he longs for us to have insight into the, to, that will enable us and empower us to enter into Jesus' experience that we too will live in the hope that he has in store for those who long to know him. This, is, this was Paul's desire, the Apostle Paul's desire, when he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. I want you to notice that's present tense. Now, Jesus has already died. He is, he is risen from the dead. He has ascended back to the Father, and yet Paul says, I want to suffer with him. Sharing in his death, present tense. Is there a death that Jesus is still dying? Is there a suffering that is still being suffered? It is through us. It is through humanity. It is through our neighbors. It is through our enemy. The suffering of individuals. Paul says, I want, to, I want to suffer with him. Jesus identified with our humanity. Can we identify with other people's sufferings? That's called empathy. Can we empathize with what people are going through? I want to enter into this suffering and sharing in his death because Jesus shared in our death. We, we imitate him when we share in other people's deaths or in other people's sufferings. So that one way or another, I will experience a resurrection from the dead. I want to enter into Christ's sufferings so that one way or another, I will experience a resurrection. And whenever I enter into other people's sufferings and show them the way, they too will have the hope of resurrection. Right? What would it mean for us to enter into the experience of, of, and journey of Jesus the Savior? Would it impact how we view the different paths set before us that we are called to walk upon? That maybe this difficult path is a part of God's will. This is the, this, maybe this is the path that will lead to resurrection. Would it impact how we, uh, would, would this, this, Entering into G- in this ex- Jesus experience, would it impact our view of others and myself? As Jesus entered into our world, he saw the brokenness of humanity. How do we view others? Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live In the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul says, I choose to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. All hinges on that. 
in what Jesus did. That changes everything. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I want to ask us to, this morning, what characterizes my life? What characterizes my life? Is it a life where I am in control? Where I am calling the shots on what pathways to take? Or is it, a, is it characterized in a Christ-controlled life to be crucified and I close with this passage from Isaiah 53 Isaiah had been given that that ability to enter into the sufferings of Christ and he described what Jesus went through some five four or five hundred years before Jesus was even born He says in Isaiah 53, who has believed our message? That's a good question for today. We need to ask the world. Has anyone in the world believed our message? Can they believe our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? Well, this is how he has revealed his powerful arm. Behold the power of God, the journey of the Savior. He writes, in describing who this person is to whom the Lord has revealed his power. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. But we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray and strayed away. We have left God's path. We have left God's path to follow our own. What characterizes our life? Is it us following our own path, or is it us staying the course on God's chosen path for our lives? Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly. Yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. That's you and I. He will enjoy a long life. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all, when he, that is God, sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, his experience, the experience that we're talking about, the Jesus experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. He that, was, he that knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels and he bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. And I close in a written prayer that was written, that's in the book that I earlier 
of violent grace. Lord Jesus, you knew from the beginning what the cost would be. And yet you and yet still you came. You took on flesh and blood so that you could bleed and die all for me. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Let me see what it means that you were born only so that you could die and that you died only to make it possible for me to be born again. And as you enable me to see, Lord, let me live in like measure by your grace. Amen. I invite you to stand this morning as we close in singing. Near the cross, near the cross.